William Riley served in the U.S. Army as a medical aid man. With over four years of military service, most of that time was in Europe with the Field Artillery Battalion. All right, tell me your name and where, where are you from? William Carl Riley, from Maryville, Tennessee. Okay, Carl. How did you join the, uh, the military? I was drafted for one year. They, they made a song, I'll be back in a year, little darling. I stayed four years, four months, and 19 days. Wow. Come back and met her, married her, 67 years ago. And I'm four years, four months, and 19 days over her. Exactly the same days I stayed in the Army. Wow. So when you were drafted, where, where did you go for your basic training? Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay. Yeah, Station Hospital, Fort Benning, Georgia. And then what, what was your job, what was your MOS? What was your job in the Army? I was inducted at Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. That's a little bit out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, went on troop train to Station Hospital. And they were going to train me for a cook. And uh, I saw that cook down there, and he was complaining about his feet hurting. So I didn't want a, that time job. I told him I'd like to get a job that I could sit down. What have you done, Mr. Rayleigh? They said in your life. And I was 22 years old at that time. I was 21 in August the 15th of that year, but that, that was May. May the 19th is when I was inducted. So I was still 21, and then in August I become 22. So he said, what have you done in your life? I said, what do you mean? What machinery have you done, worked on? I said, I drove a Caterpillar tractor or bulldozer in the, in the log woods, making roads and pushing logs out of the way, and I drove a Two old log trucks, 27 Chevrolet and a 29 Chevrolet, just bare, just put logs on it and chain it down. Take it to the sawmill and that saw lumber. I done that when I was 12 years old. Didn't have no license or nothing. But they was paying dead and I thought they wasn't. And I, I worked all winter long. Never got a penny. And I was mad when I went in. But uh, I found out after I got back from the Army that Dad was charging things up at the Berlin store and he owned his own mill. And he told me to get out one day, he you know, kicked me in the butt and said, Get out of the store. That's where I went to run off from home. And I told him, someday I'll be bigger, and I'll come back and we'll have a fight. And we did, when I come back from the Army. And he, he wrestled around and then gravels out in front of the store. Finally, he looked me at me and I said, Carl, do you think we hadn't done enough? And I said, yep. And we went over and sat down on the porch and he told me, he said, Dan, that's my daddy, he said I had eight kids to raise, and the bad winter, and if I had to fed, fed vegetables and groceries and things on the credit, you wouldn't have made it. He said, you paid for that with it working for me. And I said, well, I'm sorry. He said, no, I'm glad you come back. So, so what was, how did you, what was your job in the Army? Well, the first job I had, I went to basic, that's a basic training. And uh, on, I don't know why, we, in the medical department, we don't have guns. And uh, they put you up there shooting a rifle. And 
I'd always shot left-handed with my killing squirrel for dad. And they gave me a old 30 out six English made rifle. It was, it was, no, it was old three English made. And I shot at the, I just barely hit the target. It embarrassed me. And Master Sergeant was uh, watching us. So I went over and got five shells and put it in that, push them down in there one at a time. And they wanted you to shoot five fast as you could work the bolt and pull the trigger. So when he wasn't looking, I prime up left handed. Pow, 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 pow. Five ball time. And he looked over and grinned at me and said, Ready, I saw that. I said, You must have it eyes in the back of your head. And he said, You do. He said, You can't do it again. I reached over and got five more shells and put in there. And bam, I, I got in the top ring on one shot and the rest of four and four, four ball time. And they gave me expert. Marksman. And I didn't have to take any more. So they sent me to the ambulance shed. And I wore sandwiches there two or three days. And, and the master sergeant, the dispatcher, he said, Carl, go downtown and, and take that carry all. It's a 41 Chevrolet carry all with five seats in it. He said, You boys are going to Detroit and get a some amateurs, you drive one and tow one back. So we let off of Corporal Hammett driving him, and he was the most comical man I've ever met. His neck was about that long, it looked like. He could stick it out and see the tail out on that van. I never seen, and he just 70 to 80 miles an hour. He turned the siren on, you know, in each little town we went to, with, and we'd wake up Jesus Christ in that town with them sirens. We got up there, and uh, he had money for our food and motel, hotels, and everything. And we we got we went to the wrong place. They told us where to go, but they had the vans at a place where they put new cars. It was a storm in a big warehouse. And finally we found it. And they had a 41 Cadillac ambulance lined up there, and they had a 41 LaSalle. Well, they, it was stretched out long. And that book you got, that red book that Francis gave you, it's got. And my ambulance is the first, the Cadillac, the one I drove. And you might see the LaSalle sitting out there. Them two ambulances was assigned to me. And uh, I had to wash them, take care of them, and everything. I never did drive that LaSalle but two or three times. It was too long to be around in town, them little towns of Georgia. It's close, and you go into the service station, you go in this way and pick it up and let it back out. And it's so long it hit another car beside of it when you turn it. So we just used it in emergency. Mm -hmm. It only cost the Army half what a Cadillac did because they they made that as a special for some country across the sea. And they didn't take it. They took four of them and didn't take the fifth one. So did, did and, you? Uh, it was twelve cylinder, like two six, two six cylinder engines in that thing, and the uh, Cadillac was a V eight. I drove that Cadillac over a hundred thousand miles, half of that. Sergeant Brown was my sister driver, and we had to. You make when you sign out. They send out on their call. They make out a trip sheet, and you sign that. That means you swear that you 
change drivers every 100 miles. While, while he drives, the other, while one drives, the other sleeps. And if you got a patient in there, you don't sleep. You have to keep the sister driver. It's, the people that are driving it, it's the captain of the ship. When Sergeant Brown is driving it, he's the captain. When I drive it, I'm the captain. And I don't care if it's a colonel or major or general. In the back, they can't tell you how fast to drive. You you overrank him as a medical aid man. You got the Surgeon General of the United States backing you on that. Wow. You can't carry a gun with any ammunition in it. You can carry a 45 in that pocket there, mm -hmm. that beside of you. When you were taking mental patients somewhere, but it's got a a bogus clip in it, and you can't put no ammunition in it. Wow. When he's in the back, there's a partition behind you, and on the seat, from the seat up is glass. But you just take that pistol and hold it up like that, don't say a word, and then mental patients will quieten down <laughs> and quit trying to get out of the hammers or kicking the walls and the thing, glass. So how did how did you get overseas? To huh? when did you go overseas? Uh, uh, I took training on the tank that you saw. Uh, let me. You transferred out of Georgia into Camp Walters, Texas. Yeah, let me go off yeah. if I can. Yes. Uh, I don't remember the date that the Women's Army Corps we called them the WAPS came into the hospital. Well, I was training to be a, the dispatcher. Our dispatcher was an Irishman, red face from Ireland, freckle faced red, and he'd been there 42 years. He, he'd get broke back about 100 times for being drunk and beat people up. And he was training me to be a dispatcher. The reason of that, he said, it's because I was interested in it. I'd watch him. When he was on a on run, he stayed there at the ambulance shed. He was on 24 hours on duty and then off 24 hours. But you could go upstairs and they had bunks up there that you could lay down and sleep. And he had a a wire tied to the bunk and he'd shake the bell underneath the spring tied to the spring. And that'd wake you up. And he'd tell you where he wanted you to go and when he wanted you to come back. And I was me and Brown was a host on time every time. They could ball you out if you was late. Or they balled you out if you was fine. Come here early. He knows you speak. Basically, you're supposed at that time that was 55 miles an hour. And he'd tell you how long it takes to drive from Columbus, Georgia to Atlanta, Georgia. Anyway, the wax come in, and we had to train them to take over our job. Well, I trained them in the part of the time. Sergeant Brown, my assistant, trained them part of the time. And he wasn't 1A, and I was, so he stayed there. Will Ed Farmer from Knoxville was not 1A. 1A was the best you could have in the Army, best condition. And uh, I best four. Anyway, we went to, Fort, to Camp Roberts. Walk, uh, Fort Wall, uh, Fort Walters, huh? Fort Walters, Texas. In Texas, huh? Yeah, Fort Walters. Camp Walters. Camp Walters. That's three miles out of Mineral Wells, Texas. And uh, what you do there, you wait for, to be sent out 
in the cabin. And they, you never see nobody that, there that's all black, except the officers in the white, 21st Century Division. Or 25th one is 21st or 25th. I don't remember. That's a long time. But what they do to us, I think we stay there 16 days, 15, either 15 or 16. It rained every day, just like pouring water out of a barrel. We about five miles from camp. They had a mountain there. They call it a hill. But it was flat on top, and it had a great big roof over it. All that area it was flat, and nothing else in there. But they had two Chevrolet station wagons. All the body was all wood from the dash back to the back end. They gave you a toolbox. Put six of us in there with a lieutenant in each van each station wagon. And we'd go up there in the morning and take that wood body off, every screw out of it, every panel, lay it on the table and he'd take a picture of it. And the clock, what time we got that down. When we got it back on, he'd take a picture and the clock, how long it took us to do it. And they graded you. Where to send you and everything. And uh, they, they two station wagons and twelve men and two officers. And if you got back before dark, you done good. If you got back after dark, you had to pull K P duty. A certain minute. Or what was your primary job at Fort Walters? And then how long was you there? And how long did it take before you transferred out to California? That was my job, right? That's all I've done. So how, how did you get overseas? Well, we took... All right. Okay, tell me about the ship that you were on. It was a German-built vessel. It was a great big thing, almost as big as the Queen Mary. HMS Alexandra. England had captured it. And was hauling troops to to London, to England. We got on it in May, first of May, about the fifth of May, 1941, 1944, rather. We went to from New York to Southampton in a convoy, ships as far as you could see around on the ocean. Fourteen days to Southampton, England. They got us out of that and put us on a narrow gauge railroad. And they took us to uh, Stratford on the Avon. And Stratford is a town and Avon is a river. And up on the hill above Stratford was a castle. And our whole 558 stayed in that castle for June the 5th. And they took, we took the tanks down through Coventry, and I never seen a town so tore up. And these towns were so small. We went down there somewhere and drove in LST, and I believe theirs was number 335. LST is a landing ship tank. They got a big door in the front that lets down on the land and you drive out in the water. We did. And to keep the engines running right, they put a heater, I mean a vacuum, vacuum hose in the tailpipe and tied them up so the water didn't come up on them. And uh, that was in Sherburg, that was uh, Omaha Beach. And they was Utah Beach and another one I never, don't remember. And that was in Sherburg. And we landed the 12th of June. The van people went in the 6th. 
we went in a trap with our tanks. And they said they killed 500, I mean 5,000 soldiers there. And they was in the floating in the water. I had the cheek painted white with red crosses on them. And I pushed them out of the way with a jeep. Floating in the water, stinking. It don't it ain't worth one man to go over there. Anyway, I never I saw it. Now, further south on France is the hedgerow. The Germans on one side and we was on the other. And they was high as high. And they had horses cut in that hedge and men sitting on it. One of them was Napoleon, the fact. Everybody said it was. Napoleon used to rule France. The Germans had been in had France and they occupied France and for seven years or more. And they had all kinds of can, cannons in them banks there on Utah Beach and Omaha Beach where I saw I can't tell you about the other beaches because I didn't see them. And uh, we, I don't know whether you, we went, we headed towards Paris, you know, and we took Paris without firing a shot. And, uh, Did we went to, to Metz, where we had our next battle. On that, on that paper I got, it said, you know, on the Brown Star War, mm -hmm. it says Southern France. That's a heck of a big place. And we had a lot of battles in there. We poured on them. My discharge was only in four major battles. But Metz, Germany, that's across the border from France, where that grape vineyard tree is there, and also has some rain. And we there, they had three fortresses in there, and I mean, they railroad tracks, the trains pushed that big gun in there that shot a shell as big around the 50 gallon barrel. And they Door it open, it had trees and grass going on that door. There's a big old door go up, and they'd stick that barrel that out. And they couldn't hit us because we back there behind them in and took a bulldozer and sunk it down to the barrel, was just over the ground. And them shells would go over us. We could, they couldn't lower that gun no more because they made a mistake when they done that. That door would hold a gun up. He couldn't go down any further. He could work this way a little and that way. A little bit up. They shouldn't have had some way to do it. But, uh, and uh, Sergeant McMillan was the number four gun, uh, number four tank. He's the one that I used all the time in California as a trainer is to think that because I don't never volunteer for nothing if you go in the army. I said I didn't know the motorcycle one time they sent me to Louisiana on maneuvers with General Pat. And I wrote, I bought a motorcycle for nothing in Western Iowa before I went in. And that's what tore up my knee. I hit a cap out out. Jerry Daddy run the neighbor's world with my sisters chasing me around the barn. Yeah. Did and you I, ever did you ever see General Patton? Huh? Did you ever see General Patton? You what? Did you ever see General Patton? Oh a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, first time I saw him over there was Saint Law. And I'm not, they told us not to tell anything about St. Paul for 40 years. Because it was a boo boo. And 
they blamed some of my officers for doing it, but it was God's work. There was a place there that we were trying to get across, and Germans had it fortified with a Siegfried line, Siegfried, Siegfried line, and they 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 built up dragon take on. They was big at the bottom and come up like this, about this high. And there's one here, one there. You could ride a motorcycle from them, but you couldn't drive a vehicle like a jeep. Or, well, we took our bulldozer and started way back here pushing dirt over. We made a road went over the top of it. That's how we got into the match where them fortresses were. And uh, we were we had to be there three weeks at that one fortress. And then when we got that, took it, we went in and there and see and Sergeant McMillan was one got the hole to shot through that fort, concrete steel first one. We had it eight guns. There were twelve guys shooting at. And did y'all lose a lot of men? Huh? Did you lose a lot of men in battle? Was there a lot of people we killed in the battle? I brought back. I come back with the same men I went overseas with. Well, good. And I, they were just 106 men and, and uh, six officers. Now one of them. Uh, was a German descendant, and he went crazy. Like one time, he we had a hit the cavalry machine gun mounted on a spindle thing like that, and we used it for guard duty. Or he come out of his foxhole, he built his foxhole and put logs over it, and dirt over that. He was. And, then, and I told them all, the Captain Martina, his commander, I said, let me talk to him tonight. He's going to put him on guard duty. I said, he's dangerous. He, it ain't much difference in being mental and not mental in your head. I mean, mm -hmm. you can bump your head against a tree and you go mental. And so, were anyway, you? Anyway, I stood out there and with him. Mm -hmm. And then I had to go to Paris to get some medicine. And I asked him if you go with me. And when we drove in that big place in Paris where the warehouse was, medical warehouse, boy, these 50 girls, I guess, coming hugging us, you know, asking for cigarettes. He, he had a ball. While I was in, I get the <laughs> When I got by the town, he stuck his feet out of that down, out of that weapons car I had, and he he never worked my life that he was a good soldier after that. Wow. So, where where were you when the war ended in Europe? When the victory in Europe, where were you? I didn't understand. Victory in Europe. Where, where did you go after you left Germany? After I left Germany, after the war was over, it, they sent me to Regensburg. Sent my whole outfit. They had 1,800 women that it at Hitler had been in Germany and when he declared war and he put them as slave labor for no, just fed them at all. And uh, they had lice on them and everything else, you know, fleas, lice, bugs, and everything. They sent us to Regensburg to de lice some women. And Burn up her clothes, and some country made them coveralls. They was all 
every one of them orange. And some of the men shaved them with those old hand clippers. They cut all their hair off of their body with hand clippers. I, my job was, is try, I had four interpreters. It was Red Cross nurses. And I tried to get their names and what country they were from, their age, and if they wanted to go back to that country. And that was my job. Wow. And I don't know what the rest of them done. Mm -hmm. All of them. Some of them made them burn their clothes. Some of them shaved them. And they sprayed them with DDT powder. Mm -hmm. Now it's, you can't use it. It's, it's, it's dangerous. Yeah. So. But we was right on the Danube River. Mm -hmm. And that you ought to see. That's the prettiest river I ever seen. So how did you get home? USS Marine Raven. Yep. Your whole a unit? A Kaiserville Liberty ship. Where was the airport strip before you left Germany? Huh? Where was that airport runway that you, they, they sent the, you there after you left Germany? I guess I don't hear you, honey. What, was there an airport strip? Huh? Uh, airport strip? Where, where did you, when you got off of the boat after you left Germany, you went where? It was uh, somewhere toward Japan, uh, you've told me. Okinawa. Okinawa. Okay. That's where he. That's where he got out of the service. That uh, was open uh, That ship it was uh, is a. Uh, it wasn't a Kaiserbelt Liberty ship. It, it wasn't a ship that uh, you could run a bulldozer on. Mm -hmm. It didn't have a ramp. They put it on with a crane. So, what was it like? The war was over. You're back in America. What did it, did everyone celebrate? I don't know. We, we, when we left uh, uh, when we left Okinawa, we were headed to Japan, mm -hmm. uh, Tokyo. They were supposed to. We were supposed to make another air base, airport. The war wasn't over till after that with Japan. Mm -hmm. it, uh, 15th of August was my birthday, and we were heading to, towards Japan, and they was going to bomb it. And there was four B-29s and a Hercules bomber come in there to land on that air base we made. And they didn't have a granite or concrete, and it was all sand and, and metal things with holes in them. And we packed, we packed wet them and rolled them down like they do tar and dirt road. We was, we thought that Hercules bummer we had a, I never had seen one before. And I did you, did saying. you take a boat back to the USA? Yeah, same, or, same uh, boat we was on. fly back but to Camp Atterbury? Same boat we was on. The captain come on, I hear this, he hollered on his loudspeaker. All, all the uh, world order drivers, mount your vehicle, we're going to run them overboard, that war's over. What, did everyone cheer? And they took the rails off the front of the ship and we run them ten bulldozers, two graders, four rollers, all into the Pacific Ocean. Wow. And I offered them three of my mustard night pay. If I could just take that bulldozer home without worrying about it. I said, let it off of South America and I'll drive it home. So, so w what does it feel like being a, a World War II veteran? How does it make you feel? When I say a World War II veteran? Well, how does it make you feel being one? Well, 
I guess it's uh, I guess it's just too tired. You don't know what you're feeling. I know. Uh, since then, in the jabber job I've had, since I got out of the army, I try to give that company the best deal I can do. That's what I done in the army. I done everything I could that they want me to do, or I was supposed to. But I really done more than I was supposed to do. But. Uh, it's different to have some little lieutenant or major that you hate tell you to do something. Mm -hmm. That major I carried out of the Black Forest of Germany, I hated him. Everybody did. He was not a major, but he wore a major uniform and bag and things of so. He was an OSS which is the CIA now. But you're proud that you served your country. Yes, I am. Yeah, he is. Uh, one thing he, I'll, he I'll sometimes say, don't hear I've said it what you're asking. thousands of times, there ain't no country like the United States. Nowhere in the world. But Germany is the nearest in looks. They got Plenty of trees, they got plenty of green grass, they got some fine horses just like we have here, and fine cows. And, and the German people and the Warmack soldier was good people. And mm -hmm. the people that you had to watch was the SS troopers. Mm -hmm. Well, that's Hitler's. We're about, to, we're about to run out of memory. I just want to thank you. We'll, we'll talk some more here in a minute, but thank you for, for doing this interview today, and we're proud of your service. Huh? We're proud of your service. Well, I am too.